name is Ruhl Milkov. I am a pension fund advisor at Cardano and postdoctoral researcher at Tilburg University. During this module, we will discuss two topics, both related to investing for pension funds. The first topic is the report of the Parameter Committee of June 2019. The second topic is the Pension Agreement of June 2020, which aims to reform the Dutch pension system. The Parameter Committee is anchored in Dutch pension law. At least once every five years, a committee is asked for an expert judgment about expected investment returns and expected inflation. The parameters are used in legislation to prevent pension fund schemes from using overly optimistic assumptions. The latest parameter committee published its report in June 2019. The committee was chaired by Jeroen Dijsselbloem, the former Eurogroup president, and further consisted of six independent experts. The members of the committee, the chair included, are appointed by the Minister of Social Affairs and Employment. Why does the Dutch government use a parameter committee? The economic rationale is that there is no objective and unambiguous value for expected returns and expected inflation. For example, the expected return on stocks cannot be objectively derived from quoted prices in financial markets. Instead, subjective assumptions are required. That is why the government asks an independent committee for an expert judgment. And this brings us to the next question. What is the legal mandate of the committee? The left-hand side of the slide shows the mandate and it, com it consists of five components. The right-hand side of the screen shows the impact on pension schemes. The components one, two, and three on the screen take the form of single parameter values. The committee is asked for its judgment regarding future price and wage inflation and the return on investments. The impact of these parameters is fourfold. First, the parameters play a role in the recovery plans of pension funds with a funding deficit. More stringent parameters can make additional recovery measures necessary, such as higher contribution rates or, ultimately, cuts in pension benefits. Second, the parameters play a role for pension funds which calculate their pension contribution rates on the basis of expected future returns. Lower future expectations result in higher required contribution rates for these pension funds. Third, the parameters determine the extent to which pension funds can increase pension benefits with inflation. This is called indexation. Fourth, the parameters play a role in defined contribution pension schemes. In these schemes, participants, when they reach retirement, can choose between a fixed or a variable annuity, where the initial payout level of a variable annuity may be higher. The extent to which this is the case is restricted by the parameters. The fourth component of the mandate is an advice on a uniform economic scenario set, which is used in an annual regulatory test called the feasibility test, or in Dutch, the Haalbaarheidstoets. Finally, the fifth component is the so-called ultimate forward rate, or UFR, method. The UFR method determines the discount rate for long-term liabilities. Thereby, this method has an impact on the funding ratio of pension funds. Also, the UFR method has an impact on the required contribution rates. The economic rationale for the UFR method is that with long horizons, market information can be less reliable or even unavailable. The committee is asked for its judgment on how to determine long-term discount rates. So, which questions are not part of the legal mandate of the committee? Well, basically, all other questions. In particular, the mandate does not include the more general question as to how pension fund liabilities should be calculated. Dutch pension law stipulates that liabilities must be calculated using the term structure of interest rates. The committee is only asked for its judgment on how this term structure can be determined for long horizons. So, now we know what is included in the mandate of the, of the committee and what is not. So, let us have a look at what the Dijsselbloem Committee of June 2019, 2019 has actually recommended. The top part of the table shows the recommendations for expected inflation. The inflation parameters are the minimum values in pension legislation. The bottom part of the table show the recommendations for the expected returns on assets. 
the return parameters are maximum values in pension legislation. It is not required for this module that these numbers are memorized. So, how does the committee arrive at these parameters? Are these parameters simply equal to historic averages? The answer is no. The committee also considers insight with regards to future expectations. In fact, forward-looking insights have played an important role in the advice. This becomes clear when we look at the breakdown of the committee's expected return on listed equity. The committee departs from the long-term historic average, which is equal to 5.2% in real terms and has been derived from academic publications. In addition, the committee has made two downward adjustment, adjustments, 0.5% for a so-called re-rating effect and 0.8% for the lower level of interest rates. So, what is the economic rationale for these two downward adjustments? The first effect, the re-rating effect, is based on the argument that there has been a general decline in the risk faced by investors because the scope for diversification has increased in past decades. If this has led to a reduction in the required return on equity, then there has been a positive effect on past returns. If this argument is true, then stock markets have risen in the past for reasons that are unlikely to be repeated in the future. The second effect for a downward adjustment is related to lower interest rates. The current real interest rate is 1.6% below the historic average. Given the persistently low interest rates, the committee considers it plausible that expected returns on risky assets are also below their historical average. The committee recommends that half of the low interest rate effect is incorporated in the expected return on equity. So, this results in a downward adjustment of 0.8%, one half of 1.6%. This one half factor is subjective. The estimates in the academic literature have a very wide range. So, the committee emphasizes that the one half factor is primarily uh, a reflection of the fundamental uncertainty about how the expected return on equity depends on the level of interest rates. So, what about the return expectations for fixed income investments? These are not based on fixed parameters. Instead, the committee recommends that the expected return on AAA government bonds is derived from the term structure of interest rates. For credits, the committee recommends that the expected return is based on a linear combination of, on the one hand, the expected return on stocks, and on the other hand, the AAA government bonds. And the weights depend on the credit rating of uh, the particular investment. The 2019 committee has left this approach unchanged in comparison to the previous committee. So, let's move now to the UFR method. What are the recommendations of the committee with regards to the UFR method? The committee advises to adjust the methodology. And the figure on the slide illustrates the impact of the committee's proposal. The figure is based on the interest rate curve of April 2020, and the blue line shows the swap curve as observed in the financial market at this date. The orange line shows the term structure that is produced by the current UFR method for Dutch pension funds. The current UFR method yields a term structure that is equal to the market interest rate for horizons up to 20 years. Beyond the 20 year point, the curve converges to an ultimate forward rate which is calculated by as the, the 10 year historical average of a long term forward market interest rate. Due to this, the decline in historic due to the, the decline in interest rates over the past decade, the UFR method produces a term structure that is above the market curve for long horizons. The committee of 2019 has reviewed the current method and proposes to change it. The green curve illustrates a term structure that is that follows from the committee's proposal. So the committee proposes to exclusively use market data up to a rise of 30 years instead of 20 years. Beyond the 30 year point, convergence happens also more gradually compared to the previous method. So as you can see in the figure, the proposal of the committee results in a term structure that is much closer to the market curve. The proposed change follows from one of the starting points of the committee namely that the UFR curve should make use of market information where possible. Based on daily transaction volumes in the European swap market, the committee has concluded that the liquidity of the 30-year swaps 
is sufficient to be able to fully rely on market information up to this horizon. The government has adopted the advice of the committee and implemented the new return parameters on January 1, 2020. The UFAR method is not an advice to the minister. Instead, it is an advice to the Dutch pension regulator, DNB, which independently publishes the discount rate for pension funds. DNB has stated that the UFAR method, the new one, will be introduced in four annual steps, starting on January 1, 2021. The new method will be fully implemented by January 1, 2024. So, what is the impact of the advice of the Dijsselbloem Committee on pension schemes and their participants? The new parameters are stricter than the old parameters, uh, which were recommended by the committee five years ago. For example, the uh, expected return on public equity is adjusted downwards by a full percentage point. This has no impact on the current value of assets of pension funds, but nonetheless there are important consequences. For a number of pension funds, the new parameters will mean that the required contribution rate will exceed the current contribution rate. In addition, the recovery plans of pension funds with a funding deficit have become more critical. The new parameters can result in situations where a funding deficit makes pension, fund, pension cuts unavoid, unavoidable. The proposed change in the UFR method results in a higher present value of pension liabilities and therefore lower funding ratios for pension funds. Funding ratios can decline by more than 5 percentage points when the new UFR method is fully implemented in 2024. The exact extent of the impact of the new UFR method depends on the shape of the swap curve in the market. Also, the age composition of pension funds plays an important role. The impact of the new UFR method is larger for pension funds with relatively more young participants, as the pension liabilities of such pension funds has a longer duration. The recommendations of the uh, committee do not affect the current value of pension fund assets, as mentioned before, but they do have an impact on the way that pension fund assets are distributed over time, and thus also across generations. More stringent parameters and discount rates imply that less benefits can be paid out to current pensioners and that more pension fund assets must be set aside in order to be able to pay for the pensions of younger participants in the long run. So, the implementation of the recommendations of the committee has redistributive effects between young and old generations. The second topic is the pension agreement. In June 2020, the Minister of Social Affairs and Employment sent a memo to the Dutch Parliament in which he sets out the main features of a new pension system. The pension agreement is a result of lengthy negotiations between the government, employer organizations and labor unions. The government memo is not a pensions bill yet. Important details still have to be decided upon. However, the direction of the reform is pretty clear. The reform includes a new fiscal framework for pensions and a new pension contract. Now, in this module, we will not go in, into depth into the, the fiscal changes. Instead, we will focus on the reform of pension contracts. But before we do that, let us start with the question of why a reform of the pension system was deemed necessary. Well, most pension participants in the Netherlands participate in so-called defined benefit type of pension schemes. These schemes have become subject to a lot of public discussions, and these discussions are related to both the sustainability and the intergenerational fairness of these schemes. The working careers have become more dynamic, and ex ante solidarity transfers between generations are considered more and more undesirable, especially the so-called Doorsnee systematiek, as it is called in Dutch, is considered to be outdated, as this works out unfavorably for young participants, which might leave the fund, pension fund at a later age. In this uh, method, young participants are disadvantaged because each generation pays the same contribution rate and gets the same accrual rate, but the time value of money is not accounted for in the current method. Now, in addition, the sustainability of defined benefit schemes has come under pressure. The current framework for defined benefit schemes uh, 
The FTK is, is centered around solvency requirements. But since the crisis of 2008, many pension funds have not been able to satisfy those requirements. As a result, pension funds have not been able to increase pensions with inflation. In some cases, pension funds were required even to cut pensions. In these cases, pension rights for all participants were reduced, directly leading to lower benefit levels for retirees. These issues about both fairness and sustainability were already identified by a government committee in 2010 and have been publicly debated for more than a decade. The Pension Agreement of June 2020 proposes a large reform to structurally overcome these problems. The agreement concludes that the defined benefit contracts are not future-proof. The proposed new pension system is focused around two pension contracts which are deemed future-proof. The first contract is new and is simply referred to as the new pension contract. The second future-proof contract is the existing defined contribution contract, which will be expanded with optional solidarity elements. Now, let us start by having a better look at the design of this proposed new pension contract. On the screen, you see three main characteristics of this new pension contract. The first characteristic is that the new pension contract does not have pension liabilities. So participants do not accumulate an entitlement to a, pen, uh, to a pension benefit. Instead, participants acquire a so-called personal share in a collective pool of assets. Now, this feature has similarities with the existing defined contribution schemes, uh, in which participants build up an individual pension wealth. However, there's also a difference. In this new pension contract, the pension, the pension fund assets are the collective property of the members of a pension fund. So they are not individually allocated. Another difference is that a part of the collective assets is not allocated to anyone. This wealth is referred to as the solidarity reserve, and it can be used for risk-sharing transfers between generations. The solidarity reserve can be filled with a fraction of the contribution and a fraction of the excess returns on investment. The solidarity reserve can be used to compensate members in times when the return on their personal pension wealth is lower than expected. Legislation will impose limitations on the role of the solidarity reserve. The government memo states that the maximum size of this reserve is limited to 15% of the total assets and it cannot be negative. Now, moreover, the fraction of contributions that can go into the solidarity reserve is limited to 10%, and the fraction of the excess returns that can go into this reserve is also limited to 10%. Okay, the second characteristic of this new pension contract is that it does not include a discount rate. After all, there are no liabilities under this new contract, so the traditional role of the discount rate will disappear. Also, there is no funding ratio and there are no solvency requirements, as is the case in the FTK. The new pension contract does make use of something called a projected return, which is used to determine contribution rates and benefit levels. The benefit level of a retiree is determined in such a way that this benefit level can be maintained during the expected remaining lifetime. So lifelong pensions are made possible, and this is also done by um, sharing the mortality risk within the collective of participants. So that basically means that a long lifespan for some participants is financed by the risk of a short lifespan for other participants. The return projection in the new pension contract can be higher or lower than the term structure of interest rates that is currently used as the discount rate in the FTK. Under the new pension contract, this should not have redistributive effects between young and old generation. It only affects the speed at which participants can decumulate their own personal pension wealth. So a higher return projection leads to higher benefit levels in the short run, but is at the expense of the benefit levels later in life in the long run. 
A third characteristic of the new pension contract is that there are rules for allocating the collective investment risks to specific age cohorts. Now, there are two allocation rules. One allocation rule for hedge returns and one allocation rule for excess returns. The purpose of the hedge returns is to compensate participants for changes in interest rates. The economic rationale is that lower interest rates lead to lower return expectations and make it more expensive to finance a lifelong pension income. The extent to which interest rate is hedged is determined by pension funds themselves, and it can be differentiated across age groups. The distribution rule for excess returns can be determined in accordance with life cycle investment theory, which generally suggests that the pension wealth of younger pension scheme participants has a higher exposure to risky assets than those of older participants. Now, in comparison to the current contracts under the FTK, the new contract offers more possibilities for tailoring the investment policy to the different needs of different age groups. To see this, consider the following simple example. Let's take the situation of a pension fund that wants to fully hedge interest rate risk for its older participants and only partially hedge interest rate risk for its younger participants. Now, this is possible in a new pension contract. But in the current pension contract under the FTK, this is not possible. Under the, FTK, under the FTK, the investment strategy is determined at the total level of the pension fund. And the pension, funds, pension fund must choose whether to either fully hedge or partially hedge interest rate risk on behalf of all its participants. So, how does this pension fund contract compare to the existing defined contribution contract in the Netherlands? The similarities are shown on the left-hand side of the screen. Both types of contracts are known as premieregelingen in the new Dutch pension legislation, which means that in both schemes there, are no, there is no entitlement to a predefined benefit level. Another similarity is that under both contracts, participants accumulate a personal pension wealth. And a third similarity is that under both contracts, the risk exposure of participants is age-dependent. And finally, a similarity is that under both contracts, benefit levels can be based on projected returns. Now, there are also a number of differences, and these are shown on the right-hand side of the screen. The new pension contract does not provide for a conversion around the retirement date. In defined contribution schemes, the individual pension wealth is converted into an annuity around the retirement date. In the new pension contract, no such conversion moment exists, because the build-up phase and the payout phase, pay phase are integrated into one single collective scheme. The second difference is that DC schemes offer members a choice at the retirement date between a fixed and a variable annuity. And also, they may provide pension schemes participants with a choice between risk profiles. Under the new pension contract, it will not be possible to offer such choices to participants. A final difference concerns the borrowing constraint. The difference between the borrowing constraint between the two contracts is the following. <coughs> According to life cycle theory, it is, under certain assumptions, optimal for young participants to be invested in stocks for more than 100%. In example calculations in the appendix of the government memo, young individuals are invested in stocks for 150% in the new pension contract. This means that if stock prices go up by 50%, the pension wealth of these young participants increases by 75%. But it also means that if stock prices decrease by 50%, the pension wealth of young participants falls by 75%. So, why does the government introduce this example with a 150% exposure to stock market risk for the young? Well, the, the rationale here is that young participants have a large amount of so-called human capital in the form of future labor income. If future labor income is assumed to be not very risky, then the young participants already own a large and relatively safe asset, their human capital. Now, this can imply that it's optimal for the young to invest as much as possible uh, of their personal wealth in stocks, and if possible, even with borrowed money. 
so that they can take maximum advantage of the risk premium on risky assets in financial markets. Now, in existing defined contribution schemes with individual ownership of assets, a position in stocks of more than 100% may be difficult to implement in practice. The proposed new pension contract provides for collective ownership of assets, and this may make it easier to implement a leverage position. Another important element of the pension agreement is that the government wants to make the existing defined contribution schemes more attractive, in particular for pension funds that cover an entire industry or profession. <laughs> Such pension funds will be given the option to use the solidarity reserve also in a defined contribution scheme. Another adjustment to the existing defined contribution schemes is the fiscal framework, which will be changed to match with that of the new pension contract. On the screen, you see the roadmap towards the new pension system, as outlined in the government memo. The government hopes that a pension bill will become law by January 1st, 2022. What follows is a two-year decision period until the 1st of January 2024. In this period, decisions have to be made by social partners at the level of industries and companies. Next is a two-year implementation period. The deadline for implementation is currently foreseen on January 1, 2026. Thereafter, there is a 10-year period during which certain compensation measures related to the transition may still be in place, but in principle, the new system then starts in 2026. Let us take a closer look at the decision-making phase. What are the most important choices to be made during this period? Well, first, social partners need to decide upon the type of pension contract. They can choose between a new pension contract or a defined contribution pension scheme. I have discussed the similarities and the differences between those two contracts earlier. Second, social partners have to make the choices about the design of a new pension scheme. The most important choices are the emission level, the contribution level, the design of the retirement phase, the rules for the solidarity reserve, and a new investment policy in which the, in which the risk exposure depends on age. Moreover, social partners have to make a choice about what to do with the existing pension entitlements in their current defined benefit schemes. Now, the government memo states that, by default, existing pension rights will be converted into a personal pension wealth under either the new pension contract or a defined contribution contract. But at the same time, the government memo also states that social partners can decide not to convert existing rights if they can demonstrate that such a conversion would disproportionately disadvantage certain participants. <laughs> the government has stated that the FTK legislation will continue to apply for such pension funds. Now, finally, social partners have to make decisions about the compensation for participants who are disadvantaged by changes in the pension contract or changes in the fiscal framework. Now, we have arrived at the end of this module. The Pension reform discussed in the second part has an important link with the parameter committee discussed in the first part. A parameter committee will also have an important role in the new pension contract, because future expectations are used to determine benefit levels and contribution levels. However, in, to the, in contrast to the current FTK, a change in the parameters, or a change in the UFR method, does in principle not have redistrib redistributive effects between young and old generations. And the reason is that in these new pension contracts, participants have personal pension wealth. So a higher projected return should, in principle, not have redistributive effects between young and old.